share the slides. Uh, yeah, I'm just engaging the audience, I hope. Uh, okay, so I was saying, so to reconstruct this history of uh, Mexican semiotics, we have to think of semiotics as some sort of mole, where everything is mixed up, right? Uh, but it has some logic behind it. Okay, and one of those questions that I was asking is like, how is it that Mexico started exporting its own recipes uh, and chefs or students uh, and ingredients to those countries like Europe or, I mean, in Europe or within Europe, even to the United States, uh, from which or from where we originally imported the ingredients for making this mole. So, um, the development of, of semiotics in Mexico as an academic field of inquiry uh, cannot be understood, I mean, getting a bit more serious now, cannot be understood without considering Latin America as a whole and the circulation of books and publications within this region. Uh, and also, due to the uh, linguistic closeness that we have with Spain, with Italy, and with France. So, speaking about the history of semiotics in Mexico involves necessarily speaking about the history of semiotics in those countries. Um, okay, so taking this scenario into account, I will try to chronologically reconstruct some of this uh, history of semiotics and reflect, more importantly, on some of these events that influenced semiotic studies in Mexico until this day. Very well. Um, so, coming back to my slides that I prepared for you. Okay, so please, uh, guys now to confirm, just uh, write down in the chat section if you can see in the full mode screen uh, my presentation. Did you get any confirmation? Yes. Can you see? Okay, perfect. Very well. So, uh, this thing is um, a poster that we have at the semiotics department in the University of Tartu. It's a very nice and neat conceptual map, so to speak, or epistemological mapping of how semiotics is, in a way, constructed as a field, right? And people in Tartu University have been very successful at uh, reflecting and reconstructing their own past and understanding how semiotics came to be the way it is in this part of the world. I don't know if you can see my, yes, my, okay. So for instance, uh, you can map your development very nicely and its relationships with all these hemispheres and brains, uh, part, brain regions, so to speak, in this map. But this is in Tartu University. If we had to reconstruct more or less the same thing in Mexico, this thing, um, but it's nothing like a very neat uh, diagram. Instead, it would look like this uh, rainbow of moles, right? Right. So, um, as I just said, this analogy of Mexican mole and semiotics in Mexico, well, goes very well along. So, for those of you um, who are out there listening, you will be able, of course, to remember maybe uh, some classmates, maybe some uh, professors, people speaking about all these different ingredients that at, at some point um, intersect with semiotics. So, for instance, we have philosophy of language, oops, hermeneutics, some literary criticism, symbolic anthropology, of course, anthropology, sociolinguistics, graphic design. Studies, so yes, how to forget those. Um, communication theory, of course, and transition studies, and just to name a few of these fields, that, right, that have uh, made up the ingredients of Mexican semiotics. And semiotics, as such, it has been like the, uh, like the epistemological tool, in a way, that has, in this, uh, like, Mexican molcajete, uh, mixed up the rest of the ingredients with this rock, and I forgot the name of. So semiotics would be this thing, uh, mixing things up in a very special way. Okay. So, in a regional perspective, I mean, speaking of Latin America as a region, there are some people who have identified three main, uh, so to speak, periods in the development of semiotic studies. And of course, this is uh, outdated, but we will go through it nonetheless. So, according to Silva, and by the way, uh, the references are going to be at the end, so don't worry about like writing stuff. Anyhow, um, so according to this scholar in Latin, Latin America, we can, yeah, we can notice uh, this is structuralist period during my Marxism, Marxism sorry, uh, yes, critical theory, all these things, 
put together. And then a more globalizing tendency where semiotics worked, unquote, as a terminology without the epistemological definition. Yes, semiotics was or is a mess still in Latin America. And thirdly, this uh, a third wave concerned with the discourses and societal practices. Yeah, when it started mixing with other uh, disciplines in the region. But when it comes to Mexico as such, um, this perspective is much more complex, I would say, because, well, of course, Mexico is, uh, you could say that Mexico is different countries in one. So my presentation, this is a, an overview of what I will be just going to try to, try to go through sorry, during my presentation. And even if I don't successfully cover all the points, uh, my main goal with this presentation is so you guys have like a, just a brief look on how to how is it that semiotics came to be the way it is in Mexico nowadays. So I will try to put a, a bit more emphasis on the future rather than the past. So that's why uh, history is useful for, right? To look uh, in the future. So some comments before going into particular details. So from the 40s to the 60s, we had like this, as I said, a structuralist beginning uh, resembling the rest of the tendency in Latin American studies. But then in the 70s, this was like in Lotmanian terms, an explosive decade. So lots of organizations, lots of seminars, lots of uh, circles of studies, uh, lots of people involved in semiotics at some point in translating, in publishing, in teaching, in everything. Then in, um, in the 80s, okay, there was more organizational diversification, but it was a decade marked by all this um, distribution with, uh, among universities and programs and syllables and curriculum and teaching materials. So it became like a real uh, teaching industry, so to speak, at some point in the, in the country. Then in the 90s, well, it was when Mexican semiotics in a way started uh, not only like receiving stuff from outside, but then starting like making some like networking with people outside in Europe and other countries and started taking part in these international associations of semiotics. And including, of course, Latin American organizations of semiotics. Well, in 2000s, it's a very uh, difficult decade uh, to define because it's very eclectic. But we could call this decade the popularization of semiotics when uh, semiotics no longer became a uh, descriptive um, field of study, but also it also came, uh, became mainstream in a way, or in the sense that it was adopted in um, private universities, in marketing programs, or um, it became to be applied in other areas outside academia or hardcore pure applied, sorry, pure um, theoretical research. Okay, and when it comes to the more recent decades, uh, at least in 2010s onwards, this is more like a personal overview, so it's not necessarily like a real historical factor thing. And finally, some uh, perspectives on what's yet to come or what's happening right now in the cutting edge semiotic research. So uh, I will try to, yes, as I said, cover everything, but if not because of time constraints, I will just uh, skip some slides. I don't think it's a big deal. And I will be sharing these slides in the future, so uh, we can just chill and enjoy that uh, you're at home listening this. So let's prepare. So I hope you're still listening out there. Okay. By the way, before the 40s, that is historically the beginning of semantics in Mexico, the first affair or relationship that Mexico at some point had with semiotics was in the form of pragmatism. So the first mention of pragmatism <clears throat> in a Mexican book was by Jose Vasconcelos in this book. So if someone has still this book out there, please um, scan it, save it because I need it. Anyhow, but other than this, the actual first publication in, that arrived to Mexico or that was published in Mexico in Spanish form was the translation of uh, Ferdinand de Saussure uh, work in 1945. So according to Carlos Escolari, this edition circulated from Argentina all the way up to Mexico and paved the way for this upcoming translation of uh, structuralist ideas. So this, this, book, this translation was a big deal in Latin America. And it was translated by Amado Alonso. And well, here you have the 
the very nice image of the book. The next like big step in this structural is beginning of Mexican semiotics uh, was at Colmex or Colegio de Mexico. So they published this a nueva revista de filología hispánica uh, that basically was this other gateway for European structuralism to come into Mexico. Uh, I think the webpage is still active, so you can look it up. Okay, uh, and there is a research gap in the 50s. I haven't found any or like very significant significant uh, points to mention in this decade. So there is also a thesis research topic there for people out there. Semiotics in the 50s, what happened there? It's a mystery. Anyhow, um, then in the 60s, there was this tendency of applying semiology, right, to the study of literature uh, because James Leff, Gray Mass, Strauss, you can see in this slide, were the most popular at the time because the translations of these books were the most popular as well. And in contrast, uh, we can see that Persian semiotics or this like uh, Anglo Saxon semiotics was not very present, right? As uh, according to Colin in this uh, paper from 2014. So, this is from 60s. In the 70s, um, this was like the explosive decade when. Uh, Mexico started making semiotics like a big deal. And I won't be able to go through all the, as I said, the institutions and the people who were involved in this because it's like a list of like more than 150 people and 35 institutions that I have mapped. So it's impossible to go through them. I would just mention some important stuff, of course. So um, as, a, uh, as a personal anecdote in a way, I have to say that um, my way to understand semiotics is very tied to the way I understand communication studies programs in Mexico City, because I would say that uh, semiotics is mostly tied to that major or BA in Mexico, at least in the very beginning. So that's where you could observe the first semiotic uh, courses, uh, elective or compulsory, in, uh, an, in a university program, in communication programs. So by mapping these programs, you can understand how semiotics started to like be incorporated into universities. Uh, so yes, this is basically saying this uh, to contextualize the placement of semiotics. As I said, post-war media studies were very important back then in the 70s. So if you take a look at uh, the National University's old old uh, study programs, you can see all these uh, the theoreticians uh, of media studies and semiotics together. So the first semiotic course as such was in 75 at the uh, Escuela de Diseño del Instituto Nacional de Bellas Artes by Juan Manuel López. Uh, yeah. So by 76, semiotics was also like considered like a very steady field of research or discipline in Mexico. According to one of my uh, former teachers, uh, Jimena, sorry, uh, Regina Jimenez Otalengo. Um, okay. So in short, this explosive decade for semiotics was accompanied by a series of classic translations, translations sorry, to Spanish. So uh, prepare, hold yourself, sorry, sorry brace yourselves for uh, some of these um, flashbacks to these translations. <clears throat> so I hope there is some old school semioticians out there listening, because you might remember this book. Uh, translated by Maria Teresa Poirasan, sorry, Poirasian, um, that translated Pia Giraud. Uh, it's the infamous, the most famous, I would say, back then translation of Peirce's uh, anthology of writings that circulated all the way from Argentina to Mexico. Uh, it was translated by Beatriz Bugini, Bugni, sorry. And this, is, this was also sadly the first way that we got to, in a way, distribute person knowledge in Mexican universities. It's a messy um, anthology, incomplete, and it was decontextualized. So hers was not very well received at the point because of this uh, translation. Then another classic in the 70s, uh, we have this Diccionario Enciclopédico de las Ciencias del Lenguaje, the famous Ducrot and Todorov uh, like dictionary, as we used to refer it in, in the Faculty of Political Sciences. So this book, uh, according to Garza, played the role of an encyclopedia on semiotics and linguistics and helped those literary critics who had no theoretical foundation in semiotics or linguistics 
as some sort of like a manual or modicum of semitic and linguistic knowledge so this was like the bible back then not because i witnessed it but because i knew it because uh, i took uh, classes with people who actually learned semitics through this book and they made me read it very well classic uh, this was not very well known but this was one of the first translations to spanish of Peirce again, and it was done again in an Argentinian editorial house, uh, and it was translated by uh, Dalmacio Negro Pavón. Uh, moving forward in the 70s, in short, we can see uh, that not, not only Peirce, of course, uh, but also other authors were starting to be translated, and this paved the way for an even, an even more explosive decade in the 80s. So we can see uh, Marx, Christa, and Echo. So these were say the classic translations that made it possible for us in Mexico if you didn't uh, speak English at the time to understand what was going on with semitics in the other side of the world I will just skip this special mention that I was going to make of a book I will just try to keep it short um, so one more significant event in Mexican semitics back then in the 70s we had the first international colloquium on poetics and semiology and the goal to show this slide is to, so you see uh, some of the topics that were back then, like in the trend or um, the fashionable topics of semitics back then. So we have like the metaphor, uh, literary discourse, uh, linguistic forms, uh, like poetry from Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz. Uh, yeah, like this ambiguity, you know, referential ambiguity, poetry, and so on. So as you can see, literary studies and critics uh, was a literary theory, sorry, was very tight, uh, tied up with um, semitic studies back then. And this arguably is the first book, like the fully semiotic oriented book in Mexico uh, from 79 by Mauricio Belchot, who was yet to become one of the main uh, semioticians and Persian scholars in the decades to come, as we will see in a moment. So if you have this book, please share the, uh, the photocopies because I don't have it. <laughs> okay, very well. So coming to the 80s. Um, so first, there is like a very um, chaotic and green uh, view that according to Hilmate, Hilmate Welsh uh, was happening in the 80s. So, okay, it was a very explosive decade. It was a very diverse when it comes to translations and authors, but three or four things happen here. According to him, uh, communication, sorry, um, the masters in communications or the BAs in communications, seen semiotics as a theoretical feudalism that prevents or prevented opening to new domains. So a very dogmatic field, in other words. This author also observes that in this decade, semiotic studies um, was some sort of colonialist practice, something related to what um, Leticia was saying earlier. So my colleague was also speaking about how semitics was some sort of like a, not colonialist, but uh, related to this interpretation of European things that come to the Latin America. Anyhow, and uh, so he might well also observes that this uh, curricula in these programs had this implicit dichotomy that until this day still haunts us between Sassyrian and Persian semitics, right? It was like a very simplistic dichotomy. It's either a Pierce, a Pierce or a Saussure, nothing else. And finally, he observes this uh, bio bibliographical, sorry, this articulation in more than 75 Mexican institutions. At the time, like 25,000 uh, students, at least in communication BAs and EMAs. So it, back then, semiotics was already a mess mainly because of the fact that it was, according to Kimate Welsh, like a dogmatic field uh, full of colonialist consumption. Uh, and this disarticulation when it comes to how to, con uh, how to make the programs for students. So if we had to reconstruct what happened in the 80s and a little bit before or like earlier in the 70s, we have, uh, or we need, we need to go through all these institutions Made it possible for semiotics to become something uh, when it comes to studying in a university. These are more like that more than 35 institutions. Which of course, uh, I will not go through. I will just I just wanted to show them off 
so you can understand how complex it is to map semiotics in Mexico when it comes to institutional things. So if you don't see your uh, adscription here, if you don't see your university here, feel free to send me an email complaining. Uh, but anyhow, going further into the 80s. Uh, thankfully, uh, Thomas Sebeoc, as we would say in Mexico, el chile de todos los moles. This guy was everywhere. And this semiotician also was involved in making these two fantastic books, The Semitic Sphere and The Semitic Web. Thanks to these books, until this day, we know what the hell happened in semiotics in Latin America and in other countries uh, back then. Because what Sedeo did was to ask his colleagues around the world to write some sort of state of the art uh, of semiotics. So thanks to these books, we know what happened in many of these decades that I'm just going through very lightly and briefly. So if you want, you can see these books and go deeper into the Mexicans because everything is there. Anyhow, I'm going to the 90s. So as you can see, uh, Mexico in this decade um, became less uh, dominated by structuralism and started taking into applied semiotics, not only like theory, but also applied semiotics into our own cultural stuff, right? Then another thing worth mentioning is the sixth Congress of the International Association of Semitic Studies and American, no, sorry, I forgot what is the AIS. I think it's a, anyhow, the International Association of Semitic Studies, uh, the first ever international conference of this type happening in Guadalajara. So this, is a, this was a big thing back then. And finally, Spanish was incorporated as an official language of this association, according to Carlos Escobari. I mean, along with English, of course, and French. And this is one of the nice because, well, I'm in Tartu, uh, where Yuri Lotman is, was from, or is from, yes. Uh, so this is arguably the first Spanish translation of Lotman's work. And it's in three volumes, La Semiosfera, or Semiosfera, whatever you want to call it in three volumes. Um, it was translated by a Cuban scholar, Desiderio Navarro, who sadly passed away some years ago. Anyhow, uh, then we have also this classic, classic, classic translation by Silvia Depli, <clears throat> pardon, uh, Delpi, sorry. So basically this was also an Argentina edition that circulated all the way to Mexico. And as you can see, we have parts and So this was also like the Bible. That's one of the nicest pieces of translation also by Desiderio Navarro. Uh, this was like the gateway for the uh, portal through which we received Julia Cristeva, Intertextuality and Transtextuality from Gerard Genet. And I personally used this book for my MA, no, for my BA thesis uh, like in 2008. So if you have the copies, keep them because this book is nowhere to be seen anyway, and any, 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 um, anymore, sorry. <clears throat> This was other of the first translations in Spanish, Spanish of Peirce, but properly done. And this was done um, by uh, Colegio de Michoacán, in Mexico, in 1997, and it uh, translated some uh, parts of uh, Persian writings. As you can see, we're heading to the 2000s, where things get more complicated. These people still out there. Are you still listening? Yes. Let us know. Okay, so I will try to uh, to head to the end very very quickly. So in 2000s, something weird happened to semiotics, according to Vidales. Uh, this epistemological downgrade of semiotics, or in his own words, a reduction from a general logic to a methodological tool. So using semiotics just for the for the sake of using it, rather than recognizing his philosophical stance. As, a, as some sort of epistemology, right? So this is uh, more or less the same as observed by Corral in 2003 and Lozano, in the sense that semiotics has been typically reduced to an instrument, probably due to a misunderstanding of, as I said, its philosophical stance. Okay, so uh, 2000 is going to be just this, uh, but we can see more about it. When it comes to uh, 2010s and onwards, well, uh, some not very good things happened for semiotics. 
One of them is that there's this separation between theoretical developments and applied research, and the tendency for semiotics to confine in a, an academic uh, model or so in universities and research institutes, according to Clara. Also, something terrible and weird happened in the National University Program in the BA of Communication Studies. So, originally, semiotics was a course, I think it was a compulsory course, but then it was transformed into signification theories, which is not bad. But the thing is that semiotics lost its own uh, space as its own individual uh, discipline. So, now this new curriculum. And I don't know if it's currently still being taught, taught in the university, tries to a mix of hermeneutics and symbolic anthropology, which is wonderful, but doesn't leave much time for hardcore semiotics in a way. So it's a mix of everything, again, like a Chile Mole Pozole thing in this class. And as a former lecturer of this class, I can say that it's impossible to teach semiotics, hermeneutics, and uh, symbolic anthropology in the same semester. You know, this uh, semiotic vein or tradition in the National University is still kept alive by, uh, for instance, Ivan Islas, who is uh, having this, um, the seminar on semiotics, in short, that was formerly done by Virginia López Villegas, who was my uh, MA supervisor in Mexico. Okay, one more thing, one more important thing to mention. Uh, this is another of the decent translations and very needed translations of Peirce into Spanish. So it was done by Darin McNabb. He's now a professor at the Universidad Veracruzana. And this guy, although he's not Mexican, he's, I mean, uh, he speaks Spanish. He translates stuff from semiotics in English to Spanish. And these two books, I would say, are the jewels of the crown when it comes to uh, this popularization of semiotics uh, in Mexico. So uh, this is just some oddity thing to mention. This comes again from Argentina, but you can see already that uh, Maria Inés, Marisa Balaga, and the authors, featured, the authors featured, sorry, in this anthology are some of the people who are involved doing semiotics in this part of the world, like Stellenfeld in the northern countries, northern, sorry, northern countries, uh, we have Kaleri Kuhl, from the University, we have uh, Winfred Not, and other people who, in a way, are more involved with what's going on in semiotics nowadays in, in Tartu. So I will leave the reference at the end so you can also trace or look for this book. Of course, we have uh, Yuri Lotman's son, Mihail Lotman. He's a professor now in the university, so he's still keeping the tradition alive. Finally, some. Uh, honorary mentions of uh, important relevant stuff that has happened in the last decades in semiotics in Mexico. So we hosted the, uh, the second international colloquium on semiotics. Because Professor Sonneson, I mean, Goran Sonneson and Professor Pedro were there. Um, we also had in 2017, the uh, American Society um, of Semiotic Studies, sorry, the Semiotic Society of America held its uh, meeting in Puebla, so it was also a big deal. I was not there. I wish I was. Also, we have um, La Fels in 2019. I was not there, and I regret it. It was in Zacate Zacatecas, Mexico. And uh, it was the latest international semitics conference as, that I know of in Mexico. Okay, and finally, this is an invitation so you can uh, understand this transformation from the structuralist beginning to a more pragmaticistic or pragmatic uh, tradition nowadays in Mexican semiotics. We can see all these publications that deal with pure, hardcore, abstract philosophical semiotics and are reflecting on the very origins of semiotics in the American side by Charles Peirce, mainly by Mauricio Bouchot but also by Barry McNabb. Uh, so I invite you to check out these books in case you uh, read Spanish. Uh, so you understand what's happening in Mexican semiotics nowadays. Um, and one more mention. We have this book, Sociosemiotica y Cultura, by Julio Horta. I mean, edited by Julio Horta and other people. Uh, so this is the latest uh, semiotic anthology 
that also, again, uh, goes in depth into some uh, purely theoretical issues that semantics has to do is still with its origins. So we can see some echo, iconicity, symbols, abduction, complexity, pragmatism, and stuff. Finally, 2020, uh, what a year. So thanks to coronavirus, uh, the Senior Fest was cancelled or postponed, if I remember correctly, and uh, it's not happening. But nonetheless, you can see that this type of organizing events is still uh, a thing happening. Let me know if you know anything about Senior Fest, if it's happening or not. Okay. Uh, if you look in the National University's database of thesis, semiotic thesis, and I know some Mexican friends will be laughing so hard right now, you can see all these interesting, cutting edge, new and fresh topics that you can uh, see in thesis, dealing 100% with semiotics. And this is so exciting because this is a very healthy symptom of a renewal of semiotics or a new explosive moment in Mexico. And until this day, we can see 86 pieces in the national, only in the national university that have to do with semiotics. And if you take into account that more than 50 of these theses were done in the last uh, 15 years, this is, a, this is great news for semiotics in Mexico. One result in the search in the database. Oh wait, I forgot to mention. Uh, so this is uh, basically a uh, reggaeton. We can also see uh, corn and maize. It's a feminism, um, feminicides, um, indigenous cultures. Um, yeah, we can also see some narr narratology in a myths. We can also see, uh, yeah, like uh, all sorts of um, new semantic topics yet to be discovered. And as you can see, this is a very recent contribution. And I think I'm going to leave it there because I want to really get the, the questions session. So here are some references that I used, like the main references that I used for this presentation. You can check them later if you want. But most of them have to do with the development of semiotics along with other uh, fields of research or, or inquiry. And if I'm not forgetting anything, I think I should leave it here. And um, thank you for your time. So please now write down, if possible, your questions. The more concise, the better. I don't know if Israel, our host, is saying anything right now. Right now, I am not. There are already some comments for you in the chat. So, uh, Julio, he, he, he was just commenting that uh, the Chuck's book was republished in, uh, by Paidos in, in 2014. Nice. Uh, in fact, uh, the book was presented in uh, the Faculty of Political Science. I, oh. I, I was there. And um, also, uh, uh, the semi-office, it will probably take place next year. We, we wish you very, very good luck with that. And there is now a question for you. Grimacian semiotics in the 90s in Peru. Are these principles in force? If it's in Spanish, but the better. Okay, yes, Grimacian semiotics is a big deal in Mexico. Uh, right now, I can just think of a Professor Rafael Resendiz. He's one of the main uh, Grimacian scholars, so to speak. And I, yes, the tradition is being kept alive. And if I remember correctly, there is a research, there is a research group in Guadalajara or in Puebla. In Puebla. Yes. Yeah. So um, perhaps we can look into that later and I can recommend you some stuff to read because actually I don't know the name of the publications. But yes, of course, Grey Mass. I forgot to, to mention Grey Mass, uh, Foucault, you name it. But thank you for the question. Should we go with the next one? Okay. So, Sarah Ruiz is saying that I learned about semiotics in one semester in university and I fell in love with it. I would like to read more about it. Do you have any book in mind to begin with? Yes. Uh, as I said, please, people. Oh, sorry, this is not my presentation. This is not, this is not my presentation. I recommend for those who are asking for these uh, recommendations for uh, some of these books. Uh, 
uh, so you can start uh, querying semiotics in your own language. Mechiot is a great way to start semiotics in Mexico or in Spanish speaking environments. Okay, uh, more people, more questions. Yeah, we have a comment by Eduardo. Uh -huh. Footnote. Lockwood's first translation in Spanish was published in 1979, uh, Semiotica la Cultura, and it was edited by Jorge Lozano, but it was not translated by him. And I, do you know? In the 79. In the 79. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. I don't know what's happening here. I just wanted to go to my presentation again. <laughs> Okay, let's see if I got the right date, because, yeah, so, then if, it, if, if this person is correct, yes, it was the first Spanish translation, and not the Silvio Navarro. If you can uh, share the file, if you have it, that would be great. Yeah. So, oh, lots of questions, thanks. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the actual question is, how is the tradition of semiotics in Mexico? Do you study Lutman and semiotics of culture, first grain, mass, all this mixture, which is the strong line in Mexico? Is that oh, well, it's hard to say. It's a chile, mole, and pozole. It's a very eclectic mixture. And you can have research groups on every tradition in semiotic studies. Um, but I would dare to say that nowadays there is like a Persian renewal of ideas. And there is like a strengthening of this pragmatic side of semiotics. Not, not the best or not the, um, the best one, yeah. But there is a very strong presence of Persian semiotics nowadays in Mexico. And yes, I will share um, in my presentation, as I said, and the references do a very nice uh, job mapping this question or problem that you're asking right now. So perhaps I recommend you to take a look, even if you don't read Spanish. Some of them are in English, nonetheless, so we can do that. Okay, so Silver gives some recommendations to people asking for new semantics material. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm missing anything. No, it's okay. Just, uh, other comments were about uh, how to get in touch with uh, people organizing the semi which is mm -hmm. great. Okay. And, uh, but there are still some people uh, <coughs> writing. So. As, as a some, just one final comment before the next question comes. Um, yes, people ask me, why do you come to study semiotics in Tartu or in Estonia? Um, why do you leave Mexico so sunny and colorful? And why do you go to study this thing in, in, in Estonia? And uh, I don't, I haven't been able to give them like a full, right, straight answer. Uh, but now it makes all the sense to me because uh, in a way, I'm following this, like unconsciously perhaps, this uh, philosophical tradition that maps or dates back to all the way to some parts of Europe. So it's only fitting and it's only logical that more and more Mexicans and Latin American people come to study semiotics in these parts of the world, because we know a lot about what happened back then. And now we are fighting back in a way and proposing new stuff. So for those who have asked that question, this presentation in a way offers that type of answer. Okay, sorry. So, uh, there was a question about law semiotics. Law semiotics. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know a thing about law semiotics, but I'm sure that this is another suggestion and final one, perhaps, because we have to wrap this thing up. That if you go back to my presentation that we will be making available, you will find this um, database. So Dialnet is one of the biggest Spanish speaking databases for humanities, arts and sciences and stuff that you can find in the internet. It also has an English section, but if you speak Spanish or you can translate from Spanish in a way, you will find more than 700 theses, not to mention uh, articles from papers but only theses that have to do with semiotics. And I have found theses there that have to do with semiotics of law and even semiotics of uh, accountability, like um, people who keep tracks, uh, like uh, accounting records. So you name it. You just... So.
I will finally invite people to send an email to the address that uh, Israel has already shared. So you can keep uh, bringing the questions and you can ask for the presentations and the slides in that email address. So if you send an email asking for the presentations, I mean the slides, you can get them from that email as an, as an answer to your request. And thank you for being here. I will leave it wait, to wait, wait. Oh. We are still, we oh, more still questions. Have some people writing. Okay, yeah. so give me a second. Yeah, so uh, but this one is actually a question for Silver. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whether he has some information about the pitch, this is on Senoris of Law that was made in Harvard. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 yes. Oh, uh, actually, but uh, very good. So, uh, okay, we now have Silver's answer. <laughs> and well, yeah, so if there are truly uh, no more questions, then I think we can finish this presentation with this session today. And uh, remember that next week we will have our second session. Uh, we will be talking about uh, Senorix in Colombia uh, and uh, Senorix in Argentina. Well, actually, we are only going to be talking about one specific Argentinian edition, but anyway. And uh, yeah, so thank you very much for coming and uh, we hope to see you here Next time, sorry. The presenters next time, uh, they will be our, one of our MA students, uh, Carlos Guzman, and the other will be myself. So, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I hope you can come. And uh, now Silver has shared the uh, semiotics of law thesis that was written here in Tartu. So, very good. Uh, you can always write to us either uh, via Facebook or via the uh, Gmail account. And yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so now Martin also has some comment. Ah, very good. <laughs> so, uh, another uh, thesis. Great. Okay, so thank you very much. And uh, yeah. Oh, we, we have so many references. Thank you also to Katre. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, we'll meet you next week, uh, same time. Uh, so it's se seven uh, in the evening, uh, Tartu time. Uh, I hope that everybody can join because time should. But anyway, thank you very much and uh, see you next time.